This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace to you and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church of Warminster, and a special welcome to those who worship with us through WRDV-FM radio. Today's liturgist is Carol, and our prayers and liturgy today were prepared by Reverend Sharon Kaur for the Presbyterian Outlook. Our musical gifts are offered by Kathy Worth Balkas on organ and piano, Frank Balkas on flute, the Warminster Chimes, and our senior choir, conducted by our director of music, Dave Sathra. O oh Lord, we wait for you, and in your word we trust. By the power of your spirit, breathe new life into your people. Worship begins with the sounding of the chimes. Before turning to scripture, let us pray. God of power, as we listen for your word, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gift of your spirit be our goal and our strength, now and always. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is from Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. 
So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them. The skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves, and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves, and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. And from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 6 through 11. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you.
Our gospel lesson is from the 11th chapter of John, verses 1 through 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you and you are going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews, who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, 
and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. A few years ago, I was listening to a radio interview with an author who had just published a book. And toward the end of the interview, she was asked to share why she thought why dystopian literature has become so popular these days. And if you're not familiar with dystopian literature, think about the Hunger Games or the divergent book series that have topped bestseller lists, especially for young readers. And if you're not familiar with these titles, Dystopian literature has been around for a very long time, such as George Orwell's 1984. Or remember that 1970s movie, Soylent Green, starring Charlton Heston. Dystopian stories always feature an imagined future where civilization goes terribly off course and devolves into an inhumane version of society. And so when the author was asked that question by the radio host, her answer was that most people are drawn to dystopian stories because we know deep down how, and I'm quoting her here, human nature has proven time and again that we will indulge our baser impulses. We're on a cycle. We do well for a while, and then things go downhill. End of quote. What she said caught my attention because I listened to this uh, interview uh, during Lent one year. And to a large extent, the cycle that she described is similar to what we find in scripture especially in the overarching story of Israel's relationship to God throughout the Old Testament. And over these past several Sundays of Lent, our Old Testament lessons have taken us on a chronological tour of that cycle of God's people doing well for a while and then going downhill. The first Sunday in Lent, we saw the Lord place the man and the woman in the Garden of Eden. And things go well for a while until they decide for themselves that they know better than their creator how to order their lives. And we all know where that got them. In the following week's lesson, God called Abraham to go to the land chosen for his descendants to prosper and to become a blessing to all the nations. And Abraham obeys. But then the week after that, we saw how his descendants behave when God liberates them from slavery in Egypt and sets them on a journey to the promised land. 
and the whole way they kick and scream against the promise, convinced that Moses has led them out into the wilderness to die. And then last week's lesson hit the fast forward button to the anointing of King David, who would unify the tribes of Israel into a great kingdom and establish a dynasty of rulers to lead the nation toward its glorious future and again to be a blessing. But if you know anything about the kings who follow David, they only perpetuate the cycle of obedience and disobedience, faith and unfaith. And things go well for a while until a downward spiral takes over and Israel devolves into chaos and exile. Which brings us to today's Old Testament lesson, which takes place hundreds of years after the Exodus and the rise and fall of the kingdom of Israel. The people are, of God are now exiles in Babylon, far from their homeland. The new life begun in the wilderness journal, journey of their ancestors has devolved to a bitter end. And the vision the prophet Ezekiel receives of a valley of dry bones gives a vivid picture of a tragic and shameful reversal of the exodus when God's people find themselves once again in bondage to a foreign power, once again persona non grata among the nations, and once again a people without a home. And what's worse is that only now, when it's too late, do they see how their chronic failure to place their entire trust in God has led them to this dead end. This time, the downward curve of the cycle seems forever fixed. This time, they're convinced God really has dumped them in the middle of nowhere to die. It's over. No more emancipations, no more journeys toward freedom, no more chances. Those ancient promises to their ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, have died. God's promise of a multitude of descendants for Abraham, who would become a font of blessing for all the families of the earth, now lies scattered as a multitude of brittle, lifeless, dead bones. Too often the impact that scripture is meant to have on us is lost because we know how the story turns out. You and I already know what happens to those bones and I would be surprised if you weren't humming dim bones, dim bones, dim dry bones as Carol was reading that lesson. But before jumping to the good news in this passage, let's ponder for a moment the deep despair and helplessness this image signifies. It signifies the spiritual death of God's people, the total absence of God from their midst, and their complete separation from their source of life. They experience the exile as a permanent estrangement from the presence and protection of their God. An estrangement of their own making, which for them is a fate worse than physical death because it means having to go on living without God. Our bones are dried up, they lament, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. That's what Ezekiel's vision wants us to see before we jump to the good news. And that's what John's gospel wants us to see before Jesus calls dead Lazarus out from his tomb. Both passages want us to see 
that we can no more break the cycle of sin and death than those dry bones can reconnect themselves. We can no more choose the life God intends for us than Lazarus can raise himself from the dead. But the good news is that there is no situation so hopeless that the Lord cannot reverse. There is no stronghold of sin that the Lord cannot dismantle. There is no estrangement, whether from God or each other, that our creator cannot reconcile. And there is no death into which the Lord cannot or will not breathe new life because Christ died and rose again for us. We are no longer doomed to the cycle of sin and death. That's the old life. And that life is gone. It is over. New life in the spirit has been given to us. What Jesus calls eternal life. And sadly, far too many Christians over the years have distorted the idea of eternal life into something that happens to us only after this life is over. But when Jesus speaks about eternal life, he's not talking about exchanging the old life for a new one when we die. He's talking about receiving that new life right now. And he's not talking about quantity of life, as though the only point of believing in him is to live forever. He's talking about quality of life, where the point is to live now the new life God has breathed into us. Because when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, he tells us that the divine love that spoke the world into being and breathed life into dust has become flesh and lives in and among us, here and now and forever, breaking that downward cycle so that we can live now the way we were meant to live since the beginning in the image of God and in communion with both neighbor and enemy, not after we die, but right now and right here. And so the question Jesus asks Martha, he also asks of us. Eternal life already has been given. Do we believe this? And if so, will we live it? Friends, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen.
Let us now turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, giver of life, without your breath, we are dry bones. Without your word, we are dust. So we thank you for raising us up and joining us together as your people, the body of Christ. With gratitude and with hope, we offer our prayers to you. We pray for those whose hope is lost, who feel dried up and cut off from you. By your grace, open their graves and bring them back to the land of the living. We pray for those who are oppressed, held captive by the power of death. Release them from their chains. Unbind them and let them go. We pray for those who weep, lost and lifeless in fear and regret. Grant them the peace of your presence. We pray for those who are dying. Lift them by the good news that you are the resurrection and the life, and that though they die, they will live. We thank you, Lord, for receiving these prayers. Enable us to trust in you and to always see your glory in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve our neighbors. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen.